So wonderful. Uh, thank you uh, to the organizers for inviting me to speak today. Uh, Dr. Khalili touched upon uh, several of the issues that we'll uh, discuss today, uh, but we'll focus specifically on distal embolization. So uh, just some disclosures. So I'll start with a case. This is a 45-year-old male, heavy tobacco abuse, uh, presented with an acute myocardial infarction involving his anterior wall. And I think all of us can appreciate the thrombus burden in the proximal LAD, uh, a tubular area of, of thrombotic occlusion, TIMI zero flow. The typical treatment that we would administer to a heavy uh, thrombotic lesion, IV heparin, uh, eptifibotide, PTCA attempted, and post angioplasty, you can see restoration of some flow. Uh, however, the distal vessel, you can see, is now uh, not filling and likely full of uh, thrombus. So multiple runs of an aspiration catheter, uh, some uh, thrombin-rich uh, uh, clot was removed. And uh, as I think most of us would do, we would administer copious amounts of intracoronary vasodilators. However, that didn't work. Patient, patient was placed on a uh, 2B3A inhibitor drip loaded with ticagrelor. Uh, despite uh, multiple attempts to uh, improve outflow, uh, it wasn't successful. A troponin climbed to 195. Patient had recurrent chest pain, dynamic ST changes brought back 24 hours later. You can see persistent occlusion of the distal vessel. So a frustrating case uh, of distal embolization, and we'll put some perspective uh, on this case. So uh, the distal embolization is stressful for both the patient and the physician, and if you were to graph the interventionless cortisol level on the y-axis and the degree of distal embolization, it'd probably be a linear relationship. Starting with relatively benign nowadays, uh, periprocedural asymptomatic cardiac enzyme elevation, to transient slow flow during the intervention, to an isolated filling defect or vessel cutoff, and in the worst case scenario, no flow at all. In fact, no flow uh, is a complex mechanism, and distal embolization is only one part of the entire no flow or slow flow phenomenon. It involves individuals' susceptibility, ischemic damage, reperfusion injury, and it can be sustained or transient. The predictors of no reflow have been studied, particularly in the context of acute myocardial infarction, include advanced age, uh, blood glucose elevations, long lesions, higher reperfusion times, low TIMI grade flow to begin with, and higher thrombus burden. And the lesions that we typically are concerned about are STEMI lesions, which have the high thrombotic vert burden, degenerated vein grafts, and whenever we do orbital or uh, rotational atherectomy. And the consequences of embolization in these scenarios are worsening LV dysfunction, infarct extension or development of an infarct, increased risk of cardiogenic shock, and, and therefore increased mortality. So the distal embolization components, uh, the key component is platelet activation and thrombus embolization, and that can cause macro and microvascular occlusion. In addition, when you are manipulating atherosclerotic plaque, uh, like Dr. Khalili showed us, you can get plaque embolization, lipid part particle uh, embolization, and these are oxidized phospholipids that are vasoactive, uh, can cause spasm and no reflow. And this is the rationale for use of high-dose statin therapy prior to PCI to decrease these periprocedural events. The microvascular components are complicated, and in summary, they uh, are related to ischemia and reperfusion, cellular edema, free radical and oxidative damage, inflammation, and the liberation of vasoconstrictive entities such as serotonin. So your take-home point is you can have no macrovascular occlusion, and it can all be microvascular, and you can still have no flow, and that's the frustrating part of no reflow. So the treatment algorithms, if you have an isolated filling defect or vessel cutoff, start by checking your ACT. We get sloppy, and, and uh, we got to check our ACT. If you're using bivalrudin, make sure the IV is working and that the patient's actually getting the bivalrudin. Is it actually a thrombus uh, in that filling defect, or is it a dissection? IVIS can be helpful. Uh, in, in this case, you see that this filling defect is actually a dissection. 
clot removal, uh, generally through aspiration thrombectomy going in and coming out, running the aspiration, and in situational cases, rheolytic thrombectomy or, or use of laser. Uh, I think uh, intensification antilipylate therapy is, is often used now. Uh, uh, intracoronary injections of 2B3 inhibitors may have modest uh, benefit uh, in softer endpoints. Uh, when it's persistent and you just don't know what it is, it, in, you, you can't figure it out, I'll, sometimes placing a focal stent there uh, may be uh, beneficial. And if a cutoff's in a distal vessel unrelated to the primary lesion, it's not impacting main vessel flow, particularly in the context of a STEMI, uh, perhaps leave it and walk away. What about slow flow, transient no reflow? Uh, rule out a macrovascular problem and treat that first. So if it's a dissection, figure that out, treat it. Uh, if it's spasm, give nitroglycerin. If you're doing atherectomy, don't be in a rush. I train all the fellows to, to be uh, gentle and wait when they're doing atherectomy between runs, give appropriate pharmacotherapy. Intracoronary uh, microvasodilator therapy is very important, adenosine, nicardipine, or nitroprusside, uh, given according to the patient's heart rate and blood pressure. What about persistent no reflow? So the frustrating situation where there's absolutely no flow. Obviously, do the same things you would do for slow flow, uh, followed by empiric aspiration thrombectomy. But these patients can deteriorate quickly. So have a plan for ventricular support. Consider putting a microcatheter down in the distal bed and injecting vasodilators and uh, using uh, 2B3A uh, inhibition. Example similar to what Dr. Khalili showed, this is a RCA stented, no flow. This is, and on the panel on the, on the right is uh, uh, the same vessel after five minutes of uh, epsiximab therapy. So sometimes platelet-mediated uh, therapy is the right answer. Ounce of prevention, so uh, how do we prevent this? STEMI routine thrombectomy is no longer recommended, uh, but it doesn't mean never use it. It just means you have to be cautious with use uh, and in, uh, reserve it for large thrombus burdens. Uh, oral antiplatelet therapy now in 2017 is much more potent, but we can still consider uh, parenteral therapy. Routine filter use, particularly in STEMI, is not uh, recommended. However, there have been cases where I have put a filter down for large thrombus burden. Some data, the direct stenting may be better than predilation, and in STEMI, certainly use copious vasodilators. Vein grafts, we'll see. Filter use is still recommended. Uh, filters get full. We'll see that aspiration is important. Uh, prophylactic use of vasodilators, and avoid oversizing your stents in vein grafts. Atherectomy, we mentioned short runs and vasodilator use. And the low EF patient, think about ventricular support. So two quick cases to end. Uh, if you're going to do vein graft cases, uh, you're going to use filters. This is a case courtesy of Dr. Berlakis. This is a case of when no reflow is really not no reflow. This is an 11-year-old degenerated graft, ACS presentation. After predilation, you can see there's interruption of flow. And export catheters used for aspiration uh, of the filter, uh, and you can see the distal vessel begins to fill past the filter, but there's still uh, impaired flow. However, once the filter is retrieved, flow is restored. So what's the mechanism here? The filter can get clogged and full. So aspirations of filters can be helpful, and those of us who do carotids or lower extremities know that this sometimes is necessary. If you overfill the filter and try to uh, retrieve it, there can be spillage or cheese grating uh, of material through the filter. And in fact, I've had cases where the filter in the leg, for instance, is so full it's hard to actually retrieve because you can't collapse it. Finally, uh, last case, uh, prevention, 72-year-old diabetic female, uh, worsening angina, decompensated heart failure, low EF, it's been turned down for cabbage. Uh, PAD, left common femoral, has been stented. This is her baseline coronary anatomy. This is what she walks around with. Timmy 2 flow, ectatic vessels, calcium. This patient is extremely high risk for distal embolization. Disease vessels, Timmy 2 flow, calcified, need for atherectomy, older patient, low EF. So what can we do to try to help this patient? Poor vascular access, so I had the surgeons place a conduit uh, in the uh, axillary artery. We placed an impella CP catheter for support. Rotational atherectomy with 1.5 and 2.0 burrs. Uh, 
Uh, each rotoblader run re results in hypotension, so we use short runs, copious use of adenosine intracoronary. Ultimately, IVIS guided uh, PCI, uh, cutting balloon, placing a 3528DES in the mid vessel, and then a 60 renal stent, osteal uh, LAD. And you can see that we, uh, at the end of the case, we have restoration of baseline flow. Uh, the patient's uh, troponin goes from 0.12 to 0.36, so overall successful given the disease burden. And five months later, she's angina-free with no readmissions for heart failure. But this was a case that if we didn't do these preventative things, we were running the risk of disembolization. So uh, with that said, our take-home points are to really assess the patient and lesion risk for disembolization, understand your differential diagnoses, Think about mechanical embolism, removal of vasodilators, and prevention is always better than treatment. Thank you. Uh, that, uh, that's excellent, really excellent. And I think what, what we're going to do is we'll go through our talks and then we'll have time to come back because I think there's some overlapping and consistent themes. So our uh, next talk is uh, Michael Luna from Dallas, who's going to talk about how to treat large vessel coronary perforation.